Good evening. We are glad you have joined us for our midweek Bible study coming from the building of the Central Church of Christ in Johnson City, Tennessee. For all of our members, we're really glad that you're here and uh, all of our visitors, we're always glad to have you drop in on us and uh, honored that you would choose us to study the Bible with. And if there's other ways we can help, we'd, we'd love to help you. So let us know if there are other things. We're gonna begin by singing uh, three verses of a song, uh, number 837 for those, for those of me that has a songbook here at the building. And uh, you can follow the words on the screen as we sing this. And this is a, a good song as a prayer, and, and we feel it right now during this pandemic, but that's always true, whether we're in good times or bad. So let's, uh, let's think about these words. Greg Ryan will lead us in our devotional thoughts. I saw an article a little while back and it asked the question, what really sank the Titanic? And it goes on to argue that perhaps there were solar flares that had essentially messed up the instruments to where the people on the ship, they didn't know how to guide the ship directly or the correctly. And so therefore they ended up going where they did not want to go. It's interesting how different information often, often leads us to reevaluate a situation. Now people are reevaluating what actually happened with the Titanic as the people were on the Titanic and they're, perhaps getting false or wrong information, they're looking at it going, where do we need to go? What's the right direction? And, and obviously we know how that concluded. I want us to imagine that we're to the disciples and it's right before the crucifixion. And we know that the whole time Jesus has said that he's the Messiah, he's the one, that he had come to do the Father's will, to usher in this kingdom and then in front of everybody, this one who claimed to be the Messiah is now put to death. No kingdom, no power, no authority like you thought that he had. It maybe made them reevaluate some things. They go, some went back and started fishing again. But then what do we see? Three days later. They had to reevaluate all over again, didn't they? <laughs> because there was new information, right? He had risen. He was who he said he was. 
And even though it looked like in the midst of everything that as this new information is coming in, supposedly this new information about, well, is he really the one? You know, now he's dead. What do we do now? And yet what he had said had been true the whole time. And it caused them to rethink their rethinking. Well, that's what I want to do with us tonight. I want us to maybe rethink about something. Some of you might just feel completely stressed, feel like there's a huge weight on your shoulders. Maybe you even are to the point where you feel crushed by everything that's going on. The headlines buzz in your ears and you just wonder, why is all this happening? When will this pandemic end? Can any more worse news come out for this year? And it might even affect us to the point where we start reevaluating some things about, you know, why would God let this happen? Where is God in all of this? Does he really care about me? Does he really love me? I know he says he does, but does he really? Let's think about some reminders. While Joseph was in prison, had God abandoned him? As the Israelites were uh, taken over by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians, taken into captivity, did God ever stop loving Israel? As we see the Israelites coming out of Egypt and feeding them in the wilderness, but right before that they wondered, had God just brought us out here to die? All throughout history, for thousands of years, God never abandons his people. He continues to love them, even to the point when, we're, when they're disobedient. He doesn't like their actions, but he still loves them because they're still his creation. So just a few reminders for us tonight. God has always been there. He continues to provide for us. He is faithful even to the point where he was willing to die for you and for me. And so if you feel like you're wavering a bit in your faith tonight because of everything going on, I want to encourage you to reevaluate our situation in light of the facts. God loves you and he cares for you. None of this is too big for our God. Where are you in your faith tonight? If you need to put on Christ and baptism, we're here. Reevaluate your life's decisions. Come to know him today before it's too late. And if you have questions about how to make that happen, reach out to me or Tim Hall or Tim Haywood. Email us, call us, text us. However you want to get in contact with us, we can make it happen tonight to help you to meet Jesus. But maybe you're already a Christian and maybe you just feel like you've been crushed by the weight of everything going on. Let us encourage you with the encouragement that we've been given by Christ. Let us help you as brothers and sisters as we journey along and as God continues to provide. If you need anything, reach out. We love you. Please, please pray with me. Our God and our Father, we come to you tonight thankful for all the things that you give us each day of our lives. That even in the darkest of times, when we might feel stressed, we know that you are there. Your power is with us. Help us, as Paul admonished us to do, to pray without ceasing, to keep ourselves close to you and our communication to you open at all times. We pray that you will be with this country as decisions are made next week. Help 
your hand to show up in all the decisions that are made. We pray for those who are suffering because of the pandemic, those that are suffering because of other illnesses, those that are facing surgery. At the same time, we give thanks to you for those who have had successful procedures and those who have survived illnesses. We pray now, our Father, that you will forgive us as we so often fall short of what you would like us to be. Help us to be stronger each day of our lives. Use every opportunity we can to shine the light of Jesus and his saving power to a dark world. Be with us as we study your word tonight that we might grow as Christians. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. We have a few announcements tonight. Remember that communion sets are available for you to pick up for use at home. Call the office to set up a time to pick up yours. Standard time begins Sunday, November the 1st. Be sure to set your clocks back one hour on, Sunday, on Saturday night. Update to our prayer list. Kim is scheduled to undergo spinal surgery tomorrow. Peggy's heart ablation on Monday went well. Wesley, brother of Ruth, has had recent surgery to repair a hole in his retina. Debbie, friend of Gail and Steve, will be placed under hospice care this week. Our sympathy is extended to the family of Frances, who passed away recently. She was the aunt of Jackie. Beginning November 1st, our Sunday evening worship services will reopen to anyone who feels comfortable attending in person. And now we'll have our classes. Good evening again. Uh, welcome to our class on God Revealed Through His Laws, uh, our Wednesday night uh, class here in the auditorium. Um, not a lot of people here in the auditorium, but we hope there are several of you out there, and thank you for joining us for these studies. Um, sometimes I'll notice uh, comments that you make, either on Facebook or on YouTube, and it's so good to know who is out there listening and watching. And if you uh, haven't yet, then uh, let us know. Uh, we're not going to send you any mail, no, uh, no uh, solicitations for donations, anything like that. We would just enjoy knowing that you're there and where you're watching or listening from. Also, let us, uh, well, I guess you'll let us know if you make the comments how you're listening to us or watching us. And uh, tell others about this. It's an easy way to do evangelism. And we would love for you to invite others to join us. It's not about the teacher. It's about the, the message being taught. And that is always worth our while. So we do hope you'll spread the word and help others uh, know what we're doing here. But again, thank you for joining us. Um, again, the, the note about uh, time change, that's worth repeating. 
Uh, that's coming up this Saturday night. Before you go to bed, move your clock back. If you go to bed at 10, move it back to 9, and that means you'll get an extra hour of sleep. You don't want to miss that for sure. And uh, also, um, just be aware, we've got a hurricane coming. Uh, hurricane Zeta, I believe is the, the name of this one. It is just now hitting Louisiana, but they say it'll be running through our region tomorrow morning. It won't be a hurricane by then, but it'll be some pretty significant winds, we're told. So if you've got um, things outside, if you're in our area, you might want to secure them uh, before you go to bed tonight and make sure they don't end up in the neighbor's yard or somewhere in the next block or two. But tonight we're uh, going to continue with this study of God revealed through his laws. And the idea is, what can we learn about God by looking at some of the laws that he gave? And there are many. We've already looked at uh, a few dozen of his laws and these seven lessons that we've had. Um, and, and you might think, well, God is just, you know, wanting to show who's boss. But there's much more to it than that. I mean, God wants us to know that he is sovereign. He is in control. But we can learn things about God, and they're all good. And so what we've studied thus far is uh, here are the lessons that we've looked at, and we're not going to go through these uh, closely. Just note that there are several things we've talked about, like uh, the early Ten Commandments, the first four of those, uh, the Sabbath laws, the dietary laws, inheritance laws, uh, and all of these are, they, they show a God who cares, a God who loves us, wants us to have the best life possible, and wants our neighbors to have the best life possible. And so we're learning a lot about God as we go through this study, and I hope you're seeing that the laws are there for a reason. And by the way, um, and, and this is the next slide, thank you, um, if you don't have any, any or all of these uh, outlines, if you'd like to have them, just send me an email to this address and ask for whichever one you need or all of them, and I'll be happy to send them as attachments and an email, and then you can print them out or use them on your tablet, whatever you'd like to do. But there's a, a lot in these studies because it is a Bible study, and uh, I hope you'll take advantage of that. Now, uh, one more time, let's remind ourselves of what I call our theme statement for this class. And that is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24. And there God is uh, telling Israel through Moses, be careful to do all of the commands that God has given you. Why? Why would we want to do that? Because they are for our good always. If you remember when you were a, a young child, your parents may have told you things that they wanted you to do, and you thought, why? That doesn't sound good to me at all. Uh, broccoli, that's not on many children's favorite food list. Or brushing teeth, well, you know, I did that last week. Why do I have to do it again? Uh, but then as we get older, we begin to understand there were good reasons for those things our parents were telling us. And so it is with God. Uh, God gives us, uh, you know, laws that we may not understand now, maybe we will later as we mature in our faith, maybe we'll never understand them on this earth, but if we can grasp that principle, these are given for our good always, then it's going to make it a lot easier for us to obey even when we don't understand, because we know God has a reason whether we know it or not. So with all of that in mind, let's uh, get into the lesson for this evening, and let me introduce it by talking about this uh, idea, and, and it's suggested by the photo there of a couple, and these are wedding bands that they are showing off. And, and why is it that we wear wedding bands, uh, those of us who are married? And not everybody does, I realize. But uh, why do we do that? Well, it's to show who we are and whose we are. And that could be said for a whole lot of other things that we put out there for the public to see. It may be a, a t-shirt that we wear with our college colors and logo. It could be a license plate frame. It could be a decal on the back window of our car. There's a lot of things that we use to show the world, this is what I am. This is who I go for. This is what my values are. And sometimes maybe we shouldn't be doing what we do in that respect. 
But that's kind of the idea that we're going to be looking at as we get into this lesson tonight, because we're going to be talking about God's laws to Israel, about their apparel, their dress, and, uh, and their appearance, the way they present their bodies in, in certain ways. Now, again, let me stress this. We are talking mainly in this lesson about Old Testament laws. We'll come to the end and we'll make some New Testament applications. But a lot of what we're going to be talking about was unique to the Mosaic Covenant. It has not been carried over into our covenant. And yet, I think there are principles that are made clear as we look at these laws. So always keep that in mind when we're on, in the Old Testament. We're looking at laws that were given to Israel and maybe or maybe not carried over into our covenant. We'll have to follow up on that, you know, if, if we want to see if that speaks to us. But we're going to begin by talking about uh, the laws that are found in Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, and specifically in verses 37 through 41. And I found the word that uh, describes this law, and I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, the zitzit, <laughs> T-S-I-T-S-I-T, and uh, it is uh, undoubtedly a Hebrew word that refers to the tassels on the corners of the garments. So let's look at that law in Numbers 15, beginning in verse 37. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them, and that means here we have another law that God is making. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. It's not just right now. This is to endure as long as this covenant is in place. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandment of the Lord to do them not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. And by the way, let me just say a word about those, that last verse. Twice there, God makes the statement, I am the Lord your God. And when you look in your concordance or in your Bible computer program, that phrase, I am the Lord, occurs dozens of times. And it is as if God is saying, you need to listen to me because I am your Lord. I am the one who made you. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who made you a nation of Israel. And so it's his way of emphasizing the importance of listening and obeying. But when we go back there in verses uh, 38, uh, well, verse 38 is the essence of this law, make, a, make tassels to put on the corners of your garments. And that's one that uh, we haven't really talked about very much, at least I've not, when I've preached or taught classes. And, and it may be that some of us are not even familiar with this practice of Judaism. And yet even those today who practice Judaism, at least in the more conservative way, they will practice this uh, to some extent. Now, not, not all do, of course, but uh, well, what is that all about, putting tassels on the corners of the garments? Now, we know what a tassel is. If you remember your high school graduation or your college graduation, uh, you had this strange-looking hat that you put on your head, uh, a mortar board, it's called, and there was a tassel on top of it, and you were told to put it on one side, and then after you graduate, you're told to move it to the other side. What's that all about? Well, I can't explain that. But we know what a tassel is. And, and so God is saying, I want you to make tassels and put them on the four corners of your garments, or the, the cor corners of the, your garments. Now, let me read uh, two or three uh, commentators on this, which I think will help us to understand what's going on here a little bit better. W.H. Bellinger, Jr., for example, in the Understanding the Bible commentary, says the tassels with blue cord would stand out on the fringes of garments as the law is to stand out for people of faith. Notice that's a point he's making. It is a reminder. It is a visual reminder, just like the, the golden wedding ring. Back then, we could afford gold, and 
You know, <laughs> even a poor boy like me, I could afford a wedding band. Um, but that's a reminder. It's something that catches my eye. It reminds me I'm married. I have committed my life to one person alone, and, and I'm thankful for that. But uh, Bellinger says that was one of the reasons for it. And then he goes on. The tassels, a visual reminder of the law, constitute encouragement in living as God's people, in contrast to going after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. And Moses brings that out in the verses that follow. He says this is to remind us that we are to obey the Lord our God and not trust our own wisdom, our own judgment. Always follow what the Lord says. I also want to read to you what John Walton says in his Cultural Background Study Bible. He said tassels were attached to the outer garment used by, the, by Israelite men. Both men and women wore an outer cloak and wrapped it around their bodies or draped it over the shoulder. A belt secured it to protect a person from inclement weather. It functioned as a cover during the night and was considered valuable enough to secure a debt. And we talked about that in a recent lesson. And then he talks about how a black obelisk, which was found by archaeologists some time back, contains a picture of King Jehu of Israel with a fringed outer garment laid over his left shoulder. And so, again, this was common practice for Israelites of old, and still some that practice Judaism today are continuing this tradition. Now, we might also note that in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 12, this command is repeated, and, and it's not long, it's not even as detailed as the one that we just read, but just to impress upon us the idea that this is what God wanted, listen again to Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 12. You shall make yourself tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. And so again, God is telling Israel this is what I expect, and thus it qualifies as a law. And again, to the average person, they may say, well, what's that all about? Why would God be telling us to do something as trivial as that? Well, it's not trivial if it is a reminder to listen to God. It is a valuable reminder, kind of like tying a string on your finger. I don't know of anybody that does that now. But once, that was the way people remembered something. They would tie a, a string on their fang, finger, and hopefully they'd remember why they tied it there. But, but this fringe, this tassel, that was what it was about. The ESV Study Bible uh, also gives some details about this practice. In the ancient world, tassels were worn by nobles and other high-class people. In Israel, they are to be worn by everyone as a mark of their status as the chosen people. Blue was used in the tabernacle curtains and in the priest's vestments. And there's a couple of passages in Exodus that I have on the notes that will refer you to that. Uh, that is uh, what the, the, the curtains and the, the tabernacle that separated the most holy place from everything else. There was blue in that. And likewise, the priest's garments, and especially the high priest, had uh, this ephod made of blue, and it was a reminder that we are uh, a kingdom of priests. Let's go to Exodus 19 for a moment, because this is such a beautiful statement of what God wanted to do with his people Israel. And remember, this is before the Ten Commandments were given. The people of Israel had just come out of Egypt. They had seen the plagues. They had seen the parting of the Red Sea. And, and now they're waiting. They know something big is about to happen. God is going to uh, give them the covenant. But before he does, listen to what he says in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. He says, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And if you go back uh, to verse 5, he says, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. So God loved Israel, and he had some big plans for them. He was going to lavish his love upon them 
and really elevate them in the sight of the other nations, but it all depended on their keeping the covenant the way God gave it. And that's always the hard part, isn't it? God gives us what he knows is best for us, and yet pride builds up inside of us, and we say, well, I know better than that. I've got an easier way. I've got a better way. I can have more fun doing it that way. And pride brings us down every time. So God is doing all of this uh, to help the people remember their path to glory. And that path, summed up, was the will of God. Now, let's take a, a brief diversion from this and go to Matthew chapter 23. Because I want, to see, I want you to see how this principle was abused by the time of Jesus. Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to be looking at verse 5. Now, if you know Matthew 23, you remember this is where Jesus spends a lot of time rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites. And here's what he says in verse 5 of Matthew 23. He said, They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Now, phylacteries, you probably know, are those pouches that they would wear on their forehead. They would strap them onto their arm, and they filled the pouches with uh, bits of uh, papyrus or some other writing material, and it was like carrying our Bible. That's kind of what the equivalent would be for us today. And they said, well, I want people to think I'm really holy, so they would make broad <laughs> They're phylacteries, and, and here's somebody with just an enormous phylactery walking around. Well, why are you doing that? To impress people, if they were honest about it. And likewise, Jesus said, they make long the fringes of their garments. And he's talking about these tassels. They were wanting other people to see, look at how holy I am. And that was not at all the purpose of it. It wasn't for others to see. It was for you to see. And to be reminded that I serve a God who expects to be obeyed. So this first idea about laws regarding uh, clothing and appearance, it's one that's a little obscure to us, but man, what a great message, right, about God. He's giving us a way to remind ourselves of how important this is. Well, let's go to another uh, set of uh, laws, uh, different ones. Let's go again to Deuteronomy chapter 22. And we'll look at a, a couple of things there in Deuteronomy 22. And uh, we'll be looking at verses 9 through 11. Now, the first things we'll see here aren't related to clothing or appearance, but it ties in with what we're going to be looking at in verse 11. So tw Deuteronomy 22, beginning in verse 9. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. So there's one law. You do not sow different kinds of seed in one field. That was his law. And again, it makes us scratch our heads and say, what's going on here? Uh, I remember growing up, my dad would plant uh, the rows of uh, hickory cane corn. And then a week or two later, we'd come back and we'd uh, put seeds of... Uh, Kentucky Wonder beans in those same rows of corn. And would that be permitted in this law? Well, it doesn't look like it. Uh, you know, I haven't asked a rabbi about that particular ruling, but it looks like that might not be permissible according to this. And we wonder, what's going on? Look at verse 10. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. And this, you know, goes back to the image of a yoke, a double yoke where you've got two animals that are pulling the same plow, you're combining their energy and increasing the horsepower, you might say. And yet God says, do not yoke together an ox and a donkey. And that one we can figure out a little bit easier, I think, because the ox is probably going to be stronger than the donkey, and it ends up dragging the donkey, perhaps, or the donkey slows down the ox, and it's just not an efficient way to go about plowing your field. But again, you've got two different things combined. Now, verse 11, and this is the clothing aspect. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. 
You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. And of course, wool is uh, made from the sheep that they would raise. The linen, I believe, comes from flax that was grown. And so you don't have this mixture. You don't have blended fabrics like we do today. Virtually any article of clothing, well, there's some exceptions to that. But so many of the articles of clothing we buy now are blends of this kind. And and some of them are synthetic. They're not natural. They're man-made. But, but God is saying, no, this is not something you should do. So what, what's that all about? Well, let me read from T.D. Alexander in his Biblical Theology Study Bible. And I think he gives a, a very reasonable explanation of what we're looking at here. He says, in contrast to the confusion of the creational categories in verses 9 through 11, The tassels, now he's looking down to verse 12, which we read earlier. The tassels remind the Israelites that the Creator is to be so woven into their lives that he is part of the clothing they wear. And I like that idea because here you've got one God. We don't serve several gods, not even two gods. We serve one God, and then the clothing again becomes a reminder. We serve one God. And we don't blend. And that idea that he mentioned in the beginning of the quote, the confusion of the creational categories. And we're going to see that again here in just a moment. The confusion of the creational categories. And that's, you know, kind of a a highfalutin term, I guess. But it just means, you know, let God, you know, God did this for a reason. Maybe we ought to just leave it alone and, and accept it as it is. And uh, in this case, that appears to be part of what's going on. Now, go back to verse 5. Here's another law about clothing. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5. And and we may have heard about this one before. I know if you're my age or thereabouts, you probably remember where this verse verse was cited a number of times during some uh, heated church arguments. Uh, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. I remember when I was uh, young, um, there was a lot of controversy about women wearing pants of any kind. Uh, Women should only wear skirts or dresses, it was said. That's a woman's clothes. And when you pointed out to them that men in the Bible would wear robes, <laughs> that, that somehow got glossed over. But they would appeal to this and say, well, that shows it's just not right. And, and that really did uh, cause a lot of heated arguments. And it took several years for us to kind of reach a, a common understanding that, that this is not really crossing what God says here. But again, let me share with you something that uh, one of the commentators has written about this law You know, why not? Uh, Why would uh, a man not want to wear a woman's clothes or vice versa? Gordon McConville in the New Bible Commentary says this, The point here is not simply about fashion, but about certain deviant sexual practices signified by the wearing of the clothes of the opposite sex. It is possible, too, that some rituals of non-Israelite religions involve transvestism, and that the practice is condemned for this reason. And so again, you see, we're coming back to that idea we looked at earlier in in Alexander's comments, the confusion of the creational categories. And now we're getting down to, uh, you know, a a very hot-button issue today, and that is gender identity. You know, what gender am I? And once we knew, I mean, we understood, well, what is this child when it's born? And uh, in virtually every case, it's pretty easy to tell. There are some exceptions. But, uh, but now, you know, there are those who advocate, well, it's whatever that person chooses when they're old enough to make that choice. The Bible, however, doesn't uh, give anything that would support that theory, that approach. In fact, this is one uh, of... Uh, Several passages, we could go all the way back to Genesis 2, where it says that God made man in his image, male and female, he made them. And and that just shows there are distinct, separate genders. 
and this seems to be falling in place with that idea. So again, uh, laws about clothing, and God is just wanting us to understand, I have made life, I've made it simple, don't confuse things, and, and don't go way out there, especially when it involved idolatrous practices, which was the case in Israel and the surrounding heathen nations. Uh, God is trying to keep his people focused on him and on him alone. Now let's turn our attention to Exodus 20. We're going to go to a very different kind of uh, clothing subject, and this one's a little uh, safer to talk about, I guess, nowadays. But in Exodus chapter 20, we're going to see a statement about the clothing for the priests um, and, and a particular article of clothing. And, and let's see what it says in Exodus 20 and verse 26. Now again, we're right in the very early parts of the covenant. This is right after the Ten Commandments have been given. And God says to Moses in verse 26, You shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Now, of course, this is directed to the priest. There was no one else in Israel that was authorized to make sacrifices to God. They're, they had no business uh, doing anything on an altar if they were not a uh, priest, and, and not just any Levite either. You had to be a descendant of Aaron and be able to show that by your genealogy. So God says there, there will not be steps going up to the altar because going up might give unintended glimpses of parts of the body that should not be seen. And then go to chapter 28, and you'll find that God actually went further than that and made provision to maintain the modesty of those who were serving as priests. Uh, Exodus 28, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 42 and 43. Verses 42 and 43. You shall make for them, and he's talking again about the priest, you shall make for them linen undergarments. And, and if you're modest, you may not want to look at the picture on the screen right now. <laughs> nothing, nothing risque here, I assure you of that. Uh, you shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons, when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister to the holy place, in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. Now my understanding is this uh, photo is of uh, uh, linen breeches. I think the, the King James uses the word breeches uh, according to what appears in the Bible. That's the way we understand it. And as he said, it shall go from the hips to the thighs, and that looks like it uh, fits the bill. It's not briefs. Uh, it's not something else that could easily become immodest. This is modest. And God is saying, when my priests go about their duties, I want them to be modest. Now, why would that be? Well, of course, priests in Israel were authorities. Authority figures are often looked up to and and sometimes people try to get special favors, or they're just enamored with them, and uh, it would be easy for them to fall to temptations. In fact, you have something like that uh, in 1 Samuel 2. We're not going to read this right now, but in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, we read about the priest Eli and his sons. His sons, in the King James, are called sons of Belial, uh, in other translations, that's translated worthless men. And uh, one thing they did that made them worthless was they laid with women who were serving at the tent of the meeting. And, and they were taking advantage of their position. They were using their position of authority in order to fulfill their physical appetites. And there were other things they did as well, but these men were, were anathema to God. God told Eli in that vision that he gave to young Samuel, uh, the time is coming, your sons are going to be judged and judged very harshly. So that gives us some understanding of why God would give a law about the undergarments of the priests. But not just the undergarments. Uh, go to, well, we're there in Exodus 28. Let's just stay there. And now let's uh, go back to verses 2 through 4. Exodus 28 
verses 2 through 4, and here's what we find there. You shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. I think that's interesting. God is telling uh, Moses and, and those who work with him to prepare garments for Aaron, who is the high priest, the first high priest, and these garments are to be made for glory and for beauty. It's not, you know, something done in a slipshod manner. It's not, you know, let's go down to Goodwill and find what we can. It's, these are special. And people should see this as a special office that they are holding. He goes on and says, um, uh, You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, and here it enumerates, it itemizes the things they are to make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. And uh, the, the picture there is, of course, um, just someone's uh, best guess, uh, you know, since we don't have drawings that date from that time, but it does show these were somewhat elaborate, and it showed the people of Israel this was a serious office. Uh, you don't just show up in overalls, you know, if you're the high priest or the priest. You put on your holy garments when you serve the Lord, and that was always a, an idea. And then if you go to verse uh, 40 of this same chapter, Exodus chapter 28, and verse 40, uh, here is what we find there. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty. And there it is again. And this time, we're not just talking about the high priest. We're talking about the priesthood. And there were a lot of those. So God is giving laws about clothing, this time specifically for the uh, priests, and why? What was God showing us there that he wants the people of Israel to realize this is a very serious office. It is not something to be taken lightly. Well, now let's go to the uh, discussion, just a brief one, about physical markings. Because we find a little bit about that in the law of God as well. To see that, let's go back to Leviticus now. Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus Chapter 19, we're going to look at verses 26 through 28. And there are several things mentioned here, <clears throat> well, a few things at least. Uh, Leviticus 19, 26 through 28, and here's what God says there. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. And uh, Dan was talking about this in his uh, Sunday morning class just recently, um, how blood is a very sacred thing, the, the life is in the blood, God told Israel, and therefore when you uh, slaughter an animal for the purpose of eating it, you're to drain the blood completely as much as possible. And so this says, uh, you shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it, you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Omens, of course, were uh, signs, you know, like reading tea leaves or you know, something like that. There, there were a lot of different ways of trying to discern the future, the, and that's the whole point. What is going to happen in the future? Uh, some of you may remember the game from long ago, well, I think it's still around, the Ouija board. And that was a lot of the, the lure of that, was tell me what is going to happen in the future. And that crosses over into this same territory. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Now, this is the part that's a little bit odd, you shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves, I am the Lord. Now, again, we, we need to understand there are some very specific things that are being referenced here. And this is not a principle that ought to be taken out of context. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. But did you notice there when he said in verse uh, 28, you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead. And that gives us another indication. These are things that were being done 
in the, the cultures around them. Uh, the people of Canaan were a very wicked, evil people. That's why God drove them out of their land and gave it to Israel. And these are some of the remnants of that. And God is telling them, don't get mixed up with that. And, and so even though we may not exactly understand what it means to, to round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard, he's talking about idolatrous cultic practices, the occult as we call it today. And as we're coming up on this uh, day we call Halloween, maybe this is a good time to remind ourselves. And then he says, don't make, make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. Now, I think we need to be careful here. And I know people will uh, sometimes say to me, well, the Bible says it's wrong to have a tattoo, doesn't it? Well, if your purpose is to do it for the dead, yes, it is a sin. But I think we've got to be careful about extending it beyond what the Bible says. Uh, there's a place where God says, I have graven you on my hand. I love you that much. And it's like he's saying, and I think that's the image, I have tattooed you on my hand. I'm not ever going to forget you. So let's be careful about taking a statement and taking it out of its context and making it apply to everything. Now, I personally, I don't care for tattoos, but I know there's a lot of people that do, and it is a growing thing in our land. But I, I want us to be careful about calling something a sin that the Bible doesn't really talk about, because this is a very specific reference, and the context shows that to be the case. John Walton, again, in his Cultural Background Study Bible, says this, It can therefore be concluded that tattoos are likely banned not just because of what they do to the body, but because of what they communicate about a relationship to deity. In other words, that was what people were getting tattooed on them in that day and time, he suggests. And that is, they were showing, I am a servant of this God, which was not really a God at all, but it identified them as someone that worshipped an idol. And so that's uh, why God says what he does. And, and all the provisions around that statement, I think, make, make that clear. That's what the discussion is all about there. Let's go to one other place, and this is in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And again, we're talking about some uh, uh, personal um, physical markings. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14 verses 1 and 2. You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And so God there says, don't make yourself bald. <laughs> and if that's all you read, you're not reading enough because that's not what that says. In fact, you would go to Job chapter 1 and verse 20, where Job shaves his head in response to the tragic news he has just received about his children and all of his crops and livestock, and he shaves his head. Well, was Job guilty of sin? No. He was showing in a way that was common in that day and time how deep his grief was. But again, go back to Deuteronomy 14 and, and look at what he says. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. And again, this may have been a, a way of trying to communicate with the dead or somehow making a connection, but, but that's the idea. It's not talking about people today shaving their head. It's talking about this specific reason for it. And, and I think, again, that will show us that the idea about the tattoo is in that same category. Well, all of this shows that God did give his people certain laws about uh, dress and about physical appearance. And, and there were reasons for them. Sometimes they're pretty obvious. Sometimes maybe not as obvious. But we trust God. Now, I want us to take just uh, three or four minutes really quickly now and, and look at ourselves. Are there any laws like this for today? Well, yeah, I think generally there are. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 1. 
And let's look at verses 13 through 16. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. And listen to what Peter writes in that passage. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now there is a big principle there, and it's what I would call a law for Christians today. And that is, we're not going to be blindly following what the world tells us is cool. We are going to be holy. Whatever that means, however God applies that for us, that's what we're going to be. And did you notice also he said there in verse 15, As he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And that means... You know, the clothes I wear, uh, the words I use when I speak, the choices I make when it comes to entertainment, all kinds of things like that. I must, number one, be holy because my God is holy and he has called me to be different from the world. Now, that doesn't mean that because the world likes uh, Levi's blue jeans that I can never buy Levi's blue jeans. As long as they're modest, I don't think there's a problem with that. But just to be buying things because the world said, wow, that's cool, even though it borders on immoral or maybe even goes into that category, I think Christians have to wake up and say, I I can't go there because my calling is to be holy. And though God doesn't specifically tell us to wear tassels on the corners of our garments or to have this kind of clothing or that, There is a broad principle that does affect everything that I do. Also, um, let's think for a moment about how we look at others and the ones that aren't making the choices that we make. Let's go to James chapter 4, just the the book right before 1 Peter. James chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses um, 11 and 12. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, because here is a danger that we can easily fall into. And that is, I see somebody who has made different choices than I have. Uh, Maybe the clothing they wear is not what I would wear, or they have chosen to to have tattoos, and maybe a lot of them, and and the, the jewelry they wear, the piercings, things like that. How do I look at them? And listen to what James says In James 4, verses 11 and 12, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. And what I'm saying is, let's refrain from judgments. Let's leave that to God. I mean, true, I don't like everything I see. And sometimes what people wear, sometimes their appearance makes me say, ooh. But I can't allow that to to dictate my actions or my my love for them. I've got to be like God said he was in 1 Samuel 16, 7, when he was directing Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel. Samuel said, oh, this guy's big and tall. He looks like a king. And God says, don't look on the height of his stature, because the Lord looks on the heart. That's what we've got to do as well. Let's look past the externals and let's see the heart because we're all made in the image of God. Well, these are some laws that God gave his people Israel and there is the broader principle that relates to us and I hope we'll all do some meditating on these ideas, maybe glance through our wardrobes and see Is everything that I've got uh, in compliance with that call to be holy? Um, And then let's take it to God and ask for his wisdom. Let's conclude this lesson with a word of prayer. Will you bow with me? Our Father and our God in heaven, thank you for the Bible. What an amazing book. How wonderful it is. And even the parts that were given long ago under a different covenant, they help us, Lord 
They help us to see who you are and why you have done what you've done. And so, Father, we pray that we'll be careful students, that we will apply the word only as we should. And, Father, help us to rightly divide the word of truth so that we will not be ashamed. Bless us, Father. Bless each one of us as we study and grow in our faith. And, Lord, bless our world. Be with us during these challenging times. Lord, we need you now. We've always needed you, but especially guide us through the darkness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for being with us this evening. And if we can help you in any way, please let us know. We'll do what we can. God bless.